The energy's back. Yeah. The excitement's back. It feels like a Knicks team. It's a different, it's a different thing, man. And to watch the guys play now and the way they're playing, the playoff hopes, the determination, the competitiveness that we see, I think that energy's definitely back for sure. Welcome to Boardroom Talks. I'm your host, Eddie Gonzalez, and today I am joined by a six-time All-Star, yeah. five-time All-NBA. The first player in history to go from high school to the NBA and win Rookie of the Year. Correct. The latest member of the Phoenix Suns Ring of Honor. Right. Amari Stoudemire. Amari, how you living, Let's man? Go. I'm feeling good, brother. I'm feeling good. How's how is life these days for you? Retirement life? Like sometimes retirement life isn't that all retired. Are you busy? Are you 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 jumping around? You told me you bounce around New York, Miami. How's life these days? Life is good, bro. Um busy busy is, you know, still happens, right? You still have your investments that's still working for you. And also being spending time with the children with all their sporting activities and what and whatnot. And then also just training and just learning all those still apply to in today's time. So my my without without playing and not being in season, I have more time for those for those situations, but uh, retirement feel, it feels good, bro. How are the little ones doing? I know you have Amari. Is it junior? Like, how would you, yeah, yeah. My, my guys youngest, are getting big. I'm seeing them on Instagram. They're getting up there. Yeah, my my little guy baseball. My son basketball. My daughter plays basketball. My oldest daughter, she's taking um, sports medicine in, in college right now. So thank God, everyone's healthy. Everyone's smart. Everyone's doing great. So uh, we got no complaints. What kind of basketball dad are you? What kind of sports are you out there screaming at everybody? You talking to the coaches? Like, what are you doing? You laid back? How yeah, I'm you laid back, games? bro. My voice carries right. So if I say, <laughs> if I say, get back on defense, the whole the whole entire stadium hears me. You know what I'm saying? So I never want to really embarrass my children when they're training and playing, but I let them grow and be who they are. And then when it's time for constructive criticism or even just like, you know, confident builders. I'm there for that as well also, you know what I'm saying? Are they super serious with it or is it just like you can tell as a parent, is it a real passion for them or it's like, hey, this is what they do at the school and they're having they're fun? They're having fun, bro. Yeah. That's, I mean, at this age, at that age, it's all about having fun, enjoying it. And if you love it, then great. If you want to pursue further achievements, then awesome. If not, education's first and foremost, you know what I'm saying? So I let them have fun, enjoy life with no pressure. So let's talk about the Ring of Honor, the ceremony in Phoenix, great ceremony. Something I think has been a long time coming. You mentioned that before, new ownership. Matt Ishbia made it a point to get you out there and, and honor you, honor Sean. Um, what was it like to get that call and what was that night like for you coming back, returning home in a lot of ways and, and, and receiving that honor? It was great, man. I was, I was actually um, in Miami and I was getting ready for my son's birthday dinner. So I'm planning and trying to sort things out. I get a call from Matt and was like, yo, listen, we it's that time now that we honor you in the way which you should have been honored for a long time with the jersey retirement and the ring of honor. So I was like, great. You know what I'm saying? I was excited about it. I was overly excited. Um, we had a beautiful conversation. Then I called my children right afterwards and let them know what type of celebration we're gonna have tonight for dinner. And so being in Phoenix and receiving the love from all the fans and having a speech and having my family and friends there to celebrate with me. It was a, a beautiful, beautiful moment to see that a kid from high school, you know, drafted and then now becoming like immortalized at the arena with that judge retirement was a special moment. So the relationship with the team is obviously better now, new ownership and everything that happened with the previous ownership is out the window. Are you following the team like on a daily? Is this, Are you following the league on a daily like that still or are you just – busy in life and with your kids and stuff like that? Yeah, I keep up, I keep up, you know, I'm a basketball fan, right? I don't play anymore, but I still love the game. And so I watch all, all the guys, I watch greatness, I watch the great players, the ones who want to pursue the game at a high level. I also watch like the, the technique and the fundamentals of the game, right? It's just fun to see the poetry in motion. When you see the game being played the right way, it's a beautiful sport to watch. As you mentioned the transition from kid from high school out there to Phoenix. Woo. There had to be a lot for you. You had a lot going on with your family. Everything's happening. And you're just, at the time, you're just 19 years old. And I feel like people almost forget you you were a phenomenon almost right away. And you had the big dunk on all the little candy that was the whole thing and all this stuff. Like, you were the real deal immediately. How were you able to handle all that? Because, like, I'll be thinking about me at 18, 19. Like, I wasn't ready for nothing. And there you are. Yeah, it's true, bro. I mean, when I was in high school, I was – um you know, I grew up in a situation where it wasn't the best situation to come out of. 
right? And so then to be drafted at 18, 19, my objective was to be the best that I can be as a basketball player, but yet navigate life properly. Mm -hmm. um, so one of my main focus was, first of all, stay out of trouble, right? Be 18, 19, just sign me a $6 million contract. I'm paid in full. Mom's is good, family's good. I got money to, to spend and have a good time with. So my first objective was, all right, I'm gonna stay out of trouble and we're gonna work. And so I put in the work, I was training, I was asking questions. I was hanging out with leadership as far as like the veteran guys, even like sports analytic guys and guys that were on the color commentating side who were already retired. I would hang out with them, ask them questions about their career, how yeah. did it work, you know what I'm saying? And so I was a sponge when it comes to like learning from those veteran players and retired players and it helped me to stay out of trouble first off and also be able to propel myself to a better career. Well, that was the thing for you in the draft is like people weren't sure about your background. They're also not sure about you coming out of high school. They're acting like they don't know what they're getting. Is he immature? Is he this? Is he that? And you slip down to nine. And if you look back at that draft, it's kind of funny that you went that far down. But did that weigh on you? Was that part of your process? Like, I'm gonna prove them wrong, or you know, I know I got this together, or were you just going on about your business? I mean, I, I, to be honest with you, I didn't care, right? I know when I worked out for Houston, and they were saying if Yao Ming wasn't in this draft, we'll take you with the, with the first pick, right? And so, my confidence was always there. I knew what type of player I was. I was Mr. Basketball in Florida. I was the top player in the country, you know, from my sophomore, junior year to my senior year. You know what I'm saying? Um, and I was a kid that started from the bottom, right? I was able to just kind of navigate my way to sports and just continue to play and, and, and become the best player in high school. So my confidence was there. Um, Phoenix was a place I worked out for twice. And with me loving the city and being there, I'm like, this is a great place to live. It's like beautiful, it's quiet, it's chill. For a high school guy to go to Phoenix was a perfect opportunity because it was less activity. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And so that's why I think it worked out for me. Yeah, when I go out there with Kevin, I'm I'm actually shocked. I mean, it's funny because you come from out here and you go out there, it's flat, it's a desert, it's it's quiet, everything's spread out, there's freeways, we're not used to freeways out here, <laughs> right? And so it, that's exactly how I would describe it, is, is, is it's quiet, it's slow. And I could see, you know, at that age, how it's like, it's perfect. You can sure. just lock in, play basketball, and, and, and do your stuff. So you hit the ground running. You won rookie of the year. Next year, LeBron wins rookie of the year. By year three, now Steve's there. He's an MVP. He's an MVP candidate. He's a winning the MVP. You put up great numbers. You have an incredible series against Tim Duncan that year, and and everything's going well. Like like, what was it like at that time? And did you did you realize then the way you guys are playing? You're speeding up a little bit faster than everybody. It's the very beginnings of that. Did you realize you guys were on to something and like this could you guys could really carry this? Yeah, I knew I knew something was up because when I first got to the league, I realized the big man was slow. <laughs> and it wasn't quick. It wasn't like agile. And so my quickness and my speed and my determination to be fearless was an advantage. Yeah. Right? Um and so first year we had a good run, but then we traded a lot of guys my second year and we started to rebuild with our core group with myself, Joe Johnson and Sean Marion, who were the core guys. We needed one more player to help us. Mm -hmm. We went and brought Steve Nash. We had a couple of options, right? It was Shaq was on the table, yep. Kobe was on the table, yep. um, Nash is on the table. So I'm like, we need a point guard, mm -hmm. right? I got, I got the inside play. I'm not concerned with that. Can nobody stop me? Yep. I, I, I see it already in my second, third year. I already know what time it is. Sean was already a different kind of guy, right? Yeah. The fastest guy I ever seen play. Agile, guard any defender, or unorthodox type of game, but he'd get, he'd get the job done. Bringing in Steve was just gonna help complement all of us and our skill set. When Steve came in, it was like, you got, <laughs> you got probably the fastest, quickest big man in, in stat. You got Sean, who's now, you know, one of the most elusive players. And then Nash is just a soccer player who's playing basketball. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I like that. I like you that. You feel me? Like, and then we just we were able to take that and run with it. 
What was the relationship like with Steve instantly? Because I couldn't think of two more different guys from afar. Like, I don't know what you guys were like up close, but his background, where he came from, coming from that Dallas team, everything they had built there, his path into the league. And then you, like like I said, you were instantly a phenomenon. You were a star at that point. What was that relationship like? Did you guys hit it off immediately? How was that? It was great for a lot of for a lot of uh, reasons, right? Because obviously Steve was from born in South Africa, lived in Canada, soccer background. Me, I'm born in a small town, Lake West Florida, fresh out the hood, into high school, from high school to the NBA. But that combination of us connecting happened automatically. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like the first practice, he dropped me a dime and I took off and <laughs> shook the whole backboard, almost ripped the whole rim down. You know what I'm saying? Like that energy right there, we knew something was special. I'm sure the GMs and the ownership was like, wow, we yeah. have something great here, guys. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And so we was just able to just, that chemistry. And then not only that, when I throw parties or I go hang out, Steve would show up. Steve would come and hang out with us. He's, he's one of the guys. Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, Steve, there's a lot of guys with dreads and gold teeth here, bro. You still want to hang out? And he, and he comes out He comes out and kick it and hang out with us like with no problem. You know what I'm saying? So that energy and chemistry happened on the court and off the court, which propelled us to be, you know, to have a great run. I remember Steve had some picks go viral. It might have been with Dirt, but they were out. You know what I mean? They're having drinks. And, and that was back then. And then he did a podcast few years back maybe was, I think it was JJ's show and he was just like yeah it turns out like we're adults we go out and have drinks so I'm like all right I know the type of time Steve was like yeah, it was he's great, enjoying man. himself it was great I loved it it was awesome man so that that first season again it wins MVP um you guys hit it I, I feel like you're one of those players who people kind of forget how great you were and it's like part of it because the game has changed so much and we've moved on so much but I remember like Bill Simmons used to compare you to Moses Malone and Wilt because the physicality you play with and the athleticism. Uh, I seen a convo the other day. They were talking about Jonathan Kaminga, who I think is a great young player. And people were saying, oh, yeah, he can be Amari. And people were saying he can be better than Amari. And I'm like, I, I think you guys forget what Amari is. Does that not bother you? But do, do you see that? Do you notice that? Do you feel like people are kind of forgetting exactly what you were at the time? Because you were – you played in such a – Heavy error for that position. You were going up against Kevin Garnett, Tim Duncan, Chris Webber, Rasheed Wallace, every night in that conference. No doubt, no doubt. Dirk Nowitzki. Sure. And and you were holding, you're looking at everybody in Shaq. the eyes. Shaq. Shaq. You're Shaq, you know what I mean? These looking guys. at everybody in their eyes. Powell later, like everybody. Powell Gasol, absolutely. No doubt, um, bro. Do you feel like people are kind of forgetting what, what, what you were and what you had? I think, I think a lot of people may forget um, the success I was able to accomplish my early 20s, like from high school, and you know, my first five to, to eight years or so. Mm -hmm. And so in today's generation, they don't quite remember, you know what I'm saying, it's a short-term memory deal. Um, and then they saw me later on in my career going overseas or whatever, but it could be mixed up with a little bit of forgive, like forgiveness, like they might've forgot a lot of my, the way I played. But it's okay because I look at basketball as, you know, a beginning step of like, the progression of who, you know what I'm saying, who I am. So it's like, you know, basketball is great. I love it. I love my fans for representing and, 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 and being there, but they, I'm sure they probably forgot a lot of the situation that I was able to accomplish. So year four, that's when you had your surgery, um, kind of experimental at the time. And, and at the time it was written in like this revolutionary thing, you'll be back, you'll be healthy. Even when you came back later in that season, it was like, all right, these guys get Amari, they can make a run. I think a lot of people forget that uh, they went to the conference finals that year, got the game one off of Dallas, very well could have been in the finals that season. How tough was that that year, watching and kind of – then you come back and you feel your knee and also know, like, oh, this is kind of ready, right? Like, how tough was that that early? Because you must have been invincible on the court up until that point. Yeah, it was crazy, bro. I had no idea what the situation was. The year before, I was averaging, you know – 26 a game Yeah, <laughs> at 20 years old. You understand? All-star, dunk contest, all these things I was doing, right, at an early age, like 20 years old, 21. Um, to then not have a micro fracture, because I, I play, I'm an air player, right? I play yeah. off the ground. So a lot of times when you're an air player, you more prone to injuries, per se. You're mm -hmm. playing, you're playing, you're playing in the air, right? So when that happened, 
I didn't quite know how to recover from it. I didn't understand what it was. My first time ever having like surgery and all these things. Um, but I attacked my rehab and my recovery as if like my career is still just starting. You know what I'm saying? And so when I came back, um, that same year, that same season, I tried to come back and play. I'm like, I just not ready. I can't. You scored 20 in your first game back. I scored 20 in my first game back. <laughs> and the next day I was like, man, I'm just in a lot of pain. Yeah. yeah. And I couldn't make, I played two more games after that. And I was like, I'm shutting it down for the rest of the season. I just can't, I don't, I don't like this feeling. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the following year I came back, played all 82 games, first team all NBA, you know what I'm saying, all star. You know what I mean? So, and at that time, a lot of a lot of people was like, "Well, Stoudemire would never be the same. He's not gonna be the same player. He's micro fracture." Yeah. And I was like, "Words of death, <laughs> yeah. micro fracture." You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. you know what I, mean? I mean, at the time, I think <laughs> at now, that time. I think now you're the poster child of like, you're one of the only guys to really get back. T Mac did it. Was kind of never the same. Weber did it. He was never the same. Hard Penny Hardaway. Penny did it. Was never the same. And it, it's like it, it's a surgery they don't even use now. They don't even discuss it anymore because right. like, it's too problematic. So you, you were gotta, the guy you who got to be, you got to be, you got to attack those recoveries, bro. Like, 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 like you wouldn't believe, you know what I'm saying? You have to, tr- you have to train properly. You have to train almost to perfection, right? Yeah. And you have to also eat and take care of your body and rest. And I did all of that because I knew I'm like, I'm, I knew that I had a lot left in the tank. So I didn't want to, I don't want my career to be, you know, dampered by this injury. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So I came back with a vengeance. So that year is obviously the the hip check year, and, and we've talked about that a ton. And obviously it's – I remember the feeling of, like, it was different had you guys lost Steve, you guys lost you, and it's like, oh, they can't – they can't do nothing back. The interesting series that year to me is the, the Lakers series. And this is the series where Kobe hit one of his most iconic shots and they go up 3-1, but you guys came back. What was the energy like in that series? You know you got game seven at home later, and that ended up becoming an infamous Kobe game as well. The 3-1 wasn't a thing at the time. Now we have the Warriors, and it's like its own punchline and stuff, but you guys are sitting there, title contenders, you're back. What is the energy like from you guys as you're sitting there, like, yo, let's lock in, let's get this done? Where, where are you guys sitting after Kobe hits that shot? Well, you got to think that during that time you had Gasol and Bynum at the 4-5. And I'm, you know, it's me at six ten, <laughs> and Sean. battling both. And Sean is six eight, six seven, six eight, right? So it's like you got two seven footers double teaming me down there. Mm-hmm. So they they took advantage of that and they went up three one on us. But then I figured out a, I figured out a, a formula. Like they can't stop I me. Mean, mm-hmm. If I got shooters and the shooters gonna shoot, they got to play respectively. They can't double and triple team me. So once we figure that out. Then it was on, and we came back from we came back from that deficit. But you know, obviously, Kobe was a different animal, right? He was a guy who was, you know, took the game seriously, right? He took it even more seriously than, than, than what we can imagine. And as a, you know, you look back on this now, you see all the you see all the storylines of Kobe and how dedicated he was. You're like, dang, I ain't know Kobe was that dedicated. <laughs> yeah. I thought I was dedicated. Yeah. You feel me? I'm in the gym hours before practice, hours after practice. Kobe in the gym four in the morning. If I'd have known that, I would have got up at three in the morning. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Right. Like, but that's just a level that he was on, and it was hard to beat Kobe in his prime. So, I want to fast forward a little bit. It's actually, your last series, your last games as a son, uh, the 2010 series against Kobe as well. And um, this is to me, this is the series that the Ron Artest tip in at the end. Again, another wild game. Another wild game. Jason Richards hits a big three. You guys tied up with him going to overtime game five. Kobe airballs. It's funny when I watch that back, it, you're on the bench. You guys need a rebound. <laughs> you're on the bench. Uh, Ron Artest gets this lay in. Uh, and, and what was that like? That, again, that's your last time playing Kobe in the playoffs. This is your last series with the Suns, your last game with the Suns. Um, was all that weighing heavily on you because you had a huge summer on the way? I mean, the whole league had a huge summer. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was hot because – at that last moment, I could have, I felt like I could have did something. You know, when Kobe shot the air ball, if I was in the game, you know what I'm saying, I would have got the rebound or blocked the shot. Something would have happened. Yeah. Like, great players make great plays in the end of the games. And so, that was tough to see, right? Um, but once the series, once the series was, was over, that particular moment, 
didn't have a major impact on my decision going forward, mm -hmm. right? Because I wanted to resign with Phoenix. I was gonna resign. I had a house already <laughs> set up, had a blueprint already, you know what I'm saying, drawn up by the architect, and I was ready to kind of move forward in Phoenix. But at that time, the ownership wasn't, they were trying to make this football kind of contract where, you know, you gotta play this amount of games to get this much, and you got to do this to get that. I'm like, well, what happens if we win? If, if, what happens if we're winning by yeah, yeah. X amount of points per, in, this, in the fourth quarter and no, there's no need for me to play yep. these, these minutes or whatever, and I'm resting? Does that, does that go against my country? It was just too much gray area. So I'm like, why are we dealing with this, yeah. right? I'm the team leading scorer, le leading rebounder, leading shot blocker. Mm -hmm. We just went to the Western Conference Finals. We lost at an air ball buzzard layup <laughs> to go to the finals. Yep. And you've got the new Stockton and Malone here. you got Nash and Stoudemire, yep. which is a dynamic duo. Why would you change any of that? You know what I'm saying? And so I was all confused by the whole situation there. So I'm like, all right, I'm not going to deal with this. And that's the summer where all of us was free agents, yep. myself, LeBron, Bosh, um, Boozer, a lot of guys were free agents. And that's when I chose to come to New York. Was Miami ever on the table? I remember the rumors were all over the place. Um, but they had everybody going to Miami, right? Every That was the thought. <clears throat> but it was, like, the summer. Was that ever part of your process at once you figured out that Phoenix wasn't going to be a go? Yeah, once that 12 o'clock slot hit midnight, <laughs> the first call I got was from Miami. Yeah. Pat Riley and Alonzo Mourner called me. It was like, yo, we want you to come to Miami. We, we got everything set up for you. Don't worry about nothing. I was like, all right, well, let's, he's like, we're gonna, we're gonna take some time to figure out, you know, what's gonna happen, but we're gonna, we wanna, wanna bring you down. I'm like, all right, cool, we'll figure it out. And at that time, I was still, you know, trying to figure out what the best scenarios was. And I think D Wade and Chris Bosch had the same agent. Mm -hmm. So because they had the same agent, Miami went, I think D Wade and, 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 and Bosch kind of had a, you know, all right, well, we're the same agency, we should play together type of deal. Um, so they end up, brokering that deal with with Bosch. Um, but that's when I went to New York. Yeah, I don't know if people remember. Obviously, everybody remembers LeBron in the checkered shirt. But when Bosch announced, he announced with D-Wade, like, I think they were at a gym somewhere or something. But I think it's true. Like, there's nothing like being the man in New York. You were one of the few guys who got to experience that. What was that like? Because, again, much like when you're starting Phoenix, it was a phenomenon. It was a huge deal out here you also live through insanity which is a few years later and then mellow comes and all that but th when you got here you were the man and very few people get to be that as a nick and play in that arena and wear that jersey and it's it's like iconic every night what was that like for you it was incredible bro it was it was truly incredible because at that time the knicks didn't make the playoffs in 10 plus years there was no hope for the knicks at the time a lot of players that were there was no all-stars um, and no one wanted to come to New York. I mean, no one wanted to come to New York, right? It's like a place where wasn't even talked about as much. And I was like, oh, listen, man, I know where I want to go. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? I'm going, I'm, going to, I'm going with the Knicks, I'm going to New York. And so when I got here, the fans immediately like saw that, mm -hmm. that level of courage. And then we start playing and start winning. Then that's when the city really got on my shoulders, you know, like, let's go. You feel me? And then having the garden, like, rocking the entire stadium, standing ovations, MVP chants. We were like rock stars. You know what I'm saying? That energy alone was incredible, bro. It could never be duplicated. Um, and so I would never forget that time. It was, it was great. Oh, you'll never pay for a drink in this city? A seat, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, this, this, <laughs> oh, no. There's no, there's no, there's no bills, right? I mean, <laughs> everything was covered, everything was paid for. It was great. I hear legendary stories about Amari Stoudemire, the New York nigga. I, I, <laughs> I heard a story about you having the illest penthouse in the entire city at one point. I, yeah. I hear a lot of legendary stories. What's it like <laughs> now, watching the Knicks? They, they're on that rise again. You was at some games recently. Um, Jalen Brunson's got the city on fire. I think OG right. and Obi got the city on fire. Sure, sure. <laughs> What's it like now watching that energy kind of get back into this arena? I, I'm from the West Coast, so when I attended my first game 
in the garden was when Steph broke the record. And I was like, oh, there is nothing like this. Right. <laughs> this no, is it's, nuts. It's, a different, it's a different thing, man. And to watch the guys play now and the way they're playing, the energy's back. Yeah. The excitement's back, mm-hmm. right? When I came into New York, I was like, the Knicks are back, right? And that energy right there, I, I see that that's happening again today. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like the playoff hopes, the, the, the way guys are playing, the determination, the competitiveness that we see. Yep. Us fans, right, we love to see that, right, especially in New York. Like, we love to see that happen. So, I think that energy is definitely back for sure. It's funny. This team, like, they have all these, like, scrappy physical guards. And, and you got uh, Dante and you got Josh Hart. Like, Josh Hart's to me, like, the most New York Nick Nick I've ever seen. Like, he's he got 19 rebounds the other night. He's 6'4". Like, it's uh, it feels like a Knicks team, if that makes any sense. And and. and even last year, they bullied the Cavs. They were just too much, too strong for that team. So it's fun watching them. And I love the way they embrace the Nick legends when you guys are in the arena. I love seeing that. It, it kind of reminds me of football. Like, I feel like it happens in football a lot. Like, they bring those guys back to the stadium and sure. they're embracing that way. So I love the way they do that. Um, obviously, that was a turn for your career. You, you suffered another injury. Now you're coming off the bench. Was that tough for you or – like you can't really prepare for that, right? You sign a big contract, you're a star. Uh, what was that transition like for you? And then you end up going to Miami, and then, and it goes from there. What was that part of your career like for you? It was it was difficult because I wanted to win and I wanted to be on the court, but then injuries start catching up. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. And it's, it was a matter of now being able to just persevere through those in order to be there for my teammates when the time was needed. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that was that was a moment where I was trying like switching up my eating habits, just doing everything I could from a health conscious standpoint to stay healthy. Um, and so I would train, you know, before and after practice to make sure my strength is there and all these things. So it was a moment where it was a struggle to really continue to to build and grow as a player. Um, and then so you know as that went on. I came back, played. We had a good run, playoffs. We did, we you know, we did the best we could, and then from there I went to Miami. A lot of people turn that into an indictment on Tom Thibodeau, and it's like I always say, like injured players, they want to play. You know what I mean? You wanted to play, and then coach doesn't want you to get injured. Did you, did you ever view it like that as the player? Like, yo, I'm playing too many minutes, or because that turned into this conversation about him. It carries to this day now, and like. Josh Hart plays 48 minutes when gets like, oh, my God, Tibbs is doing this. Did you ever view it that way or you were just out there hooping? No, I mean, obviously players want to play, right? And when you're healthy, you're healthy. And coaches want to win. Yeah. So if your star player is ready to go, then let's go, you know? Um, and so any anytime, anytime a coach has a, a mindset <clears throat> of wanting his players to, to, to play and be successful, and if we're ready and capable of, of – of, playing those minutes, then let's go for it. Mm-hmm. You know, so that, that was my mindset. Like, if I'm healthy and ready to go, put me out there, coach. I ain't, you know, I'm not going to sit here and watch my team lose or opposing team go on a run and I can't do nothing about <laughs> yeah. it. And I'm healthy. Yeah. <laughs> you feel me? So the coaches do understand. But there's also a great area because most players will kind of overlook how they really feel mm-hmm. to, and play through it. But the coach is like, well, if you play through it tonight, tomorrow night you're going to be sore. <laughs> yeah, or the next yeah. night you're going to be. Yeah. So they, they do have a, a kind of a thin line to walk when it comes to that. Well, we see that a lot now, like with uh, low management. And you got guys complaining like, oh, I could have went publicly and privately. You have conversations with guys all the time like, yeah, I wanted to play, but the trainer, they shut me down. You know what I mean? Like, um, It's just a, a different league now. When you watch this league and, and – not to be like old grumpy guy, but it's not as physical, right? And especially the way you played. Um, you're one of those guys, like, I could not imagine how amazing you would look if you played today. Do you see that when you look in the court? And it's, it's such a different game. I, I won't say better or worse. It's just a different game. It's faster. They shoot more threes, everything. Is that how you see the league as well? Like, man, I could have killed it out there. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, this is what we started in Phoenix. Yeah. Right, with the seven seconds of less team. We were the guys who set the tone for like high octane scoring, three point shooting. You know what I'm saying? You score, we back at you before you look up. Seven seconds, we got a basket. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? 
And so now we see the NBA has took on that trend and most teams are playing that way. So obviously if we played in today's game, it would be the same success or even more, right? I don't see a lot of players rolling to the basket and finishing like the way Mm-mm. we did in Phoenix. You know what I'm saying? Um, I don't see a, I don't see a true point guard the way Nash was able to be a pure true point guard and pass the rock to everybody equally like that. You know what I'm saying? I don't see I, I can't name one point guard that in the league right now that plays that way. Right. You know what I'm saying? Mostly now we have scoring point guards. Um, so we would we would definitely have a lot of success in this in today's game, and it's less physical. Yeah. And I'm a physical player. Yeah. <laughs> so when I take the basket, I led the league in and ones for for four straight years. And you improved your free throw shooting when you got in the league. Right. You ended up just being an 83 percent free throw shooter once. Like you right. worked on that. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Um, Nash is always an interesting guy to me. I think people not forget, but he was probably the best shooter in the league when he played. It was me, him, Ray, Allen, other guys like that, but. He was taking a lot of threes off the dribble. Like, he's an incredible shooter. He just didn't shoot as much as he would if he played today. Like, I, again, you're one of those players I would love to have seen. I think it's tailor-made for you. Um, for me, your return to basketball, you did an overseas stint. But you came back and you coached. Uh, you reunited with Steve, right, in Brooklyn, on the Brooklyn bench. What was that like for you? Uh, stayed for a couple of years, you know, leaving kind of quietly. Um, a lot of over, overturn over there. How was coaching for you? You're not coaching now, so I'm, I'm, I'm guessing wasn't all that excited. Yeah, it's it was good. It's it was a job. Good. It's a, job. It's it's a, a real job. job, bro. It's a real job. It's a full time job. And for me, coaching, you know, I played it with a level of like integrity and excellence, right? I wanted to pursue the game in an excellent way. And coaching wise, it's a lot of babysitting. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? If you're not, if you don't want to work, you don't want to be the best. <laughs> then I can't find the motivation to teach you. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Because I want, I'm showing you, I'm showing you how to be the best and you don't want to be the best. It's frustrating for me. You know what I'm saying? Because mm-hmm. that's the only way I know how to train and play. I've always trained to be an all-star, always trained to be a champion. The summer times, I'm trained with the mindset to be a champion or an all-star or all NBA. So my work ethic was shown by because of that, you know what yeah. I'm saying? And if I can't, and if you don't want this same type of approach, you don't want the same type of accomplishment, it's hard for me to now dumb down my training. So it was frustrating for me. Um, but it was also fun from a leadership standpoint because you can now give over your knowledge mm-hmm. to the players and for the ones who want to learn and want to be great, you can give that over to them and watch them grow, which is the most exciting part for me is watching the players take the knowledge I'm giving them and watch them perform and see them having success and see them now enjoying success yeah. and see their family enjoying their success. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the great part about coaching that I that I enjoyed. Very eventful run for that Nets team, obviously. Obviously, we were around for that <laughs> with Kevin and all that. Um, interesting stuff. W- one thing I want to talk to you about is your, your conversion to Judaism is obviously very much publicized and you've talked about it a ton and your reasons why and, and all of the things you've discovered about yourself. But what I wonder from afar is what a, what made you want to have that as public as it was in the sense of like that is something you could have done in private and nobody would have ever known. But I do I do think it is important to put that out there. What was it for you that was like, I want the world to know I'm doing this. I want the world to know why and why it's important for me. Yeah, I didn't want the world to know at all. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want the world to know. I was in 2010, I went to, I traveled to Israel and I was studying my Hebraic roots. My mom was telling me we're from the lost tribes of Israel. We should reconnect the laws of Moses and that we should learn how to keep the laws properly. And I was a teenager, I was 12 years old, 13 years old. My mom told me this. So I started learning. All right, what is Shabbat? What does that mean? It says in the Bible, you should keep Shabbat. Okay, what does that mean? You should eat these animals and not those animals. Okay, what does that mean? So I was learning since I was a teenager. Mm-hmm. I got to the NBA, start, I kept learning my entire, all my NBA career. 2010, I went to Israel, and I wanted to see what I've been learning. Mm-hmm. And when I traveled to Israel, I had an interview, and they were asking me, like, why are you here? You know, I was like, I'm here to rediscover my Hebraic roots. And they're like, oh, so you're, oh, so you're Jewish, so you're learning, are you? So I'm like, yeah, I guess, I, technically we all are connected to the, to the Torah. We all connected to God and the Bible. So from that point, it became, 
a whole world yeah, yeah. awakening. It was a it was a huge. It was a huge deal. It still and, is now. Like, right, and I wasn't I, was, I, was, I wasn't my intent. I was going to learn yeah. privately with my family and friends to go and learn, and it became public, um, and my journey then became public. Mm -hmm. So now I have no there's no other way around it. Right, it's like a, it's a public thing now, but the original intent wasn't for it to be that way. It's interesting you say that because that was my immediate thought was like that seems like a private family matter. I know it was rooted in relationship with your mother as well. But since then you have embraced it and kind of been willing to be outspoken. Is that you had to grow into that or like is it a sense of pride now or Well I think I think now it's a matter of like just showing the level of learning that is required, you know, to reach a level of, of scholarship. You know what I'm saying? And so I think a lot of us fail to realize like to learn Torah you have to First of all, learn the language of Hebrew, right? To be able to read it. So when you're praying and you and you're studying, you can read the language. Um, and that and that requires, you know, constant toil, right? And so for me to show that to the people is for me I think it's great because they can see like what it takes. And it's not far fetched. When I was growing up, I was reading all these things in the Bible and the Torah and I didn't know what was I had nobody to ask questions to or to figure out how to do this properly. Like, how do I properly keep Shabbat? I had no idea. I'm like, I said Shabbat, and I'm like, all right, well, I'm just gonna say Shabbat Shalom. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure what that really means. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, all right, well, it says eat these clean animals and not those unclean animals. Okay, well, I never heard anything kosher, never heard the term kosher when mm -hmm. I'm in my hood, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So for the kids out there who are in the environment that I was once in, they can see, oh, well, this is this is what kosher is, and they can see my page or follow my learnings, and they can have the confidence to want to ask questions or pursue their growth if they want. I think it's it's interesting watching your journey and and ha you having you do it so publicly and having to have to as well. It's uh, it's a heavy weight to bear, but I feel like you bear it well and you 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 represent well for the journey you've been on as well. So. Sure. It's, again, like I said, it's fascinating for me to watch. <clears throat> More off the court stuff, you mentioned, like, you know, you did so much so early in your career. It's, it's funny, we don't think about it this way because we watch you guys on TV and we see you and we just associate you as basketball players, but there's a whole life after basketball. You've begun that, you're thriving in that. Stoudemire Wines. Sure. What what got you here? I know the wine bath was its own thing, <laughs> like, you know, <laughs> but... <laughs> Like many things you've done in your career became a big deal, but didn't right. necessarily mean to be. What right. got you here? What got you passionate about this and, and, and your other businesses on the court as well? It's funny you mentioned that because I know you said earlier about the penthouse I had here in New York. It was a crazy, ill spot, bro. Overlooking the entire city, panoramic 360 view of all the all, all, of, all the Manhattan and also the Hudson over in Jersey. We had the whole view, right? So I used to have these parties, the wine, dinner parties, invite celebrities, friends, loved ones. We all come over to my crib, play cards, we sit down, had a tattoo. You know, my guy Bane Bane was a tattoo artist. We had tattoo parties. We have, I had a music record label. So my artists would come over and record, had a music studio in my place. So they all record music. And so I would have these wine pairing tasting dinners. And because of it, the guy who provided the alcohol, the booze at the time with the wine, the tequila and these things for the party, he was like, Sadamar, you should probably have your own wine one day, bro. You love wine, you should look into it. And I was like, all right, yeah, I mean, it sounds cool. Didn't really think about it much, right? Um, but then that started to resonate with me more, and I was like, all right, well, let's try to look into it and see what that looks like. And that's when I met um, a company out of Israel, also in California. We started having these conversations, and then I started tasting the different juices on what the proper blend would be, if I did want to start this thing, and then the labeling, how does that work? It took a while for me to find the labeling. Um, and so we came up with side of my wines and we now we have an entire collection. It's 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 interesting to see I think you were ahead of the curve with a lot of this stuff too. Just, uh, you know, wine is kind of a little more within the league now, within the culture as well. It's like you know, I think we all hit that age where it's like, I think I'd rather have a glass of red tonight rather than some tequila. Well, or it's, it's, it's luxury. You yeah. feel me? Like, that's how I looked at it. When I traveled the world, I, I just traveled to Europe and do wine pairing and tastings. But it's a luxury It's a luxury vibe. You dress nice. 
you're going to great establishments, you're drinking wine, you're having good conversation with good people. That's the lifestyle. And I figured that out early, you know, and that's, and that's why the, the wine, the start of my wine brand was started. And now you, you're right, everyone now has wine brands or they drink wine, but it's a luxury, it's a luxury vibe. Yeah. So the last thing I want to ask you about is, this surprised me, researching this and just kind of thinking aloud about it. The Hall of Fame, which I think would be an incredible bow to your career. It's great to see you make amends with Phoenix, put your jersey in the Raptors. Uh, I'm shocked you're not in the Hall of Fame. We see the finalists this year, some great players. Looks like Chauncey Billups is going to get in, somebody you battled with in your career. is It's obviously something you want. Um, what do you think the weight is there? And, you know, I feel like you're going to get in in due time. I don't know why it takes so long, but what, what do you think is the story there with that? Well, the Hall of Fame is based upon a retired player that have been retired for four years from playing basketball. In that fifth year, you're eligible for the Hall of Fame. Mm -hmm. I've only been retired now for three years, or this is my fourth year of being retired. Yeah. So technically, I'm not eligible before the Hall of Fame. Right? Well, I seen when I look, I seen you. I saw that. I yeah. saw that, and I think the reason why now the finalists are different because they realized well, Stoudemire played in 2022. Yeah. So he, you know, I won a championship, got Finals MVP. Just recently, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying. Um, I know I went to coach the Nets for two years and been in Miami now for a year and a half, two years, but I've only been retired now for only four years, if that. Yeah. Um, so technically, I'm not eligible yet to be a Hall of Famer, but God willing. 2025, that should be the year. Yeah, I've seen the list this year. I've seen a lot of conversation about when you'll get in, should you get in, all that stuff. It sounds like it's going to be Vince this year, Chauncey Billups, nice group. I mean, I think, look, the numbers back you being a Hall of Famer, great career, again, uh, five-time All-NBA, not a lot of guys are doing that. And it, what I mentioned earlier, too, the guys you played against in that era, and you stood tall next to everybody, outplayed a lot of those guys. I think it's only right. So hopefully we get to see that soon. Hopefully you get that honor. Let's go. And, and Let's uh, go. can't wait to see it, my guy. Yes, sir. Thanks so much for doing this. Yeah, I man. Know you got, I know you got a long trip on the way tonight. Yeah, no doubt. Um, it's been a long time coming. And congratulations again on the Ring Honor. Well deserved. My brother, I appreciate Amari it. Amari Stoudemire. Let's go. My guy.